Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, The Wickoff Group, Genova Burns, Jean Tomasi Webster, Greenberg Trorick. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, HAP Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, Urban American, and These Friends. I want to be a, a trader. I don't know. How do you decide that you want to be in, in the trading? How do you, you leave uh, the Korean War, you get involved with a uh, stockbroker, you're a runner, then you have a son who, who says, hey, you know, I want to be a baseball player, baseball player, and, and, and then forget that I want, to, I want to be a sports columnist, a lawyer. Hey, then he decides to get involved with real estate trading, but trading of securities and investment banking, and then Avian, other things, SBICs, that's the story of a father and son team. And I'm very lucky today to have Edwin Cantor and Stephen Cantor, Edwin being the chairman of S2K and Stephen Cantor being the CEO of S2K. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you for having us. So since you are the younger person over here, why don't you tell Thank you me? For that comment. Okay. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how your parents came over here? You said they were born here. Your parents. Yeah, my parents were born here. Uh, and they, and my, my grandparents were born overseas. So they were born. You think maybe in Poland? You were saying. My grandparents were probably born in Poland many many years ago. So I, I didn't yeah, talk much when, about. When it. you were growing up, you grew up in the East New York section of Brooklyn. I brought up in Brownsville, the East New York section of Brooklyn went to Thomas Jefferson High School. So tell me about growing up in uh, Brooklyn in those days. I mean, because now people are thinking of going to East New York, made the Blasio, it was a different time. It was- uh, It sure is a different time. And where I grew up, basically, obviously there was no television, there was not just radio. And all day long when I was a kid, we just played stickball, handball. I'm sure people my age can reminisce about those days. Didn't have any steam heat, didn't have any refrigerator. But uh, we, we enjoyed our time. You enjoyed your life. Now, enjoyed you said to life. me your father was like a paper hanger. My father was a paper hanger, and during the war, he uh, had to uh, travel to uh, Cleveland, Ohio to work because he couldn't get any work here in New York during the wartime. So you graduate, Jeff, and at that time, we're in the Korean War conflict, and you're uh, drafted. I was drafted in 1952. And where do you go while you're drafted? I went to Indiantown Gap for uh, my basic training. And then after my basic training in the Intel Gap, Pennsylvania, I went to Korea. Were you married at this time when you? No, I, when I came back in 1954 and got married in 1955. So how did you meet his, uh, his lovely mother? Well, she was in Jefferson and we had a blind date. That's how I met her, at a blind date in, in 1950, 49, 1950. So you come back 
Uh, you're still, you moved back to East New York with your parents? Or? I moved back to uh, East New York at Flappish Avenue with my parents. So yes. what are you, what are you going to be doing now? Because this is before you started going on the GI Bill to NYU. Well, but before that, I used uh, the GI Bill to go to college. I, never, I couldn't graduate. I didn't go to college. I couldn't afford it. So, but I used the GI Bill to go to college at night. And I went to NYU at night on, and majored in finance. When you were young, did you have any idea about the street, about trading, or anything like that? Not a clue. So how do you get the, the first job? Well, uh, when I graduated high, high school, I didn't have a job. But, I, but my uncle gave me a job just filling... Um, bags with uh, bolts and nuts. You had a friend who was uh, in the Boy Scouts that you were Michael in Schneider. Michael Schneider. And I, was a, I was very active in, a, in the Boy Scouts, and Michael Schneider was a scoutmaster. And uh, we, we, he, came, he liked me and got me a job at uh, L.F. Rothschild uh, in 19, I think it was 1950. Like, now, what was L.F. Rothschild like at that time? L.F. Rothschild was a major, uh, a major firm. Uh, and basically a, a equivalent to uh, a Morgan Stanley or a Goldman Sachs in those days. Now, you started as a runner, you said? You started as a runner, went to, uh, progressed to the back office. Then from the back office, I went on the uh, trading desk, the fixed income trading desk, uh, traded, uh, then went to risk arbitrage after that, and then in 1952, I went to the service. So what happens after that? In 1954, I got back. I went back to L.F. Rothschild on risk arbitrage. Uh, very unhappy. was making $50 a week at that time and doing risk arbitrage. And then um, Mike Schneider, who left L.F. Rothschild, went to a small firm called Burnham & Company. I uh, kept in touch with him, talked to him about it. And he says, why don't you come over here and talk to one of our senior partners? I went over there. This is when? This is 1955. Before the birth of... Um, I'm still not... I'm still you're still, you're you're still, still, not, still not around. Not yet. even a thought. Okay, we'll get to you in a minute. And then in 1955, I went over there, and he, interesting, said, uh, we have an opening in fixed income. There was only about... There was Mike Schneider, one or two other people. There was a three-man department. Now he was an interesting guy. He, was, he, he started the company in 1931, uh, he, his family was in the bourbon business, Old Hickory uh, Liquor, and uh, he, they called him Tubby Berman. And uh, so he merges... We merge with Drexel Firestone. What, what year is that? 73? Now, Drexel Firestone, the Firestone was the Firestone lumber, uh, fire, rubber. It was the tire rubber. So now, you're living in Brooklyn, and when Steve's the oldest of uh, the three, correct? Right. So you were born when? 1957. Do you remember those days in Brooklyn? I, I don't really remember them at all. We moved out when I was pretty young to, to Plainview, Long Island, which was farm town back then. Our backyard was a farm. And that's probably my earliest memories. So you're, you're, you're growing up in Plainview. Pop is schlepping to the city. At that time, every, every, all the financial companies were in lower Manhattan. There That's was correct. nowhere else. 60 broad. 60, 60 broad. broad. We were 15 broad the first time, then we moved to 60 broad. And then subsequently, how do you get involved with bond trading? Well, I, Michael wanted me in the bond department and, and bond trading. And I, and at that time, when you did new issues in utilities, it was competitive bidding. Not, not it's completely different today. And um, one day he sends me to one of these meetings, pre-pricing meeting. And I go there, he said, just, just take notes, tell, us what, tell me what's going on. And I walk in there and I see all these people, and here I'm in my 20s, and I see all these people that are in their 50s and 60s. I said, that's where I want to be. And that's really where I got love for fixed income. What is truly fixed income for my audience to understand? Fixed income is uh, bonds, as a maturity, as an interest rate, it's issued by corporations. It's debt. It's a debt security. It's a debt that the company owns the buyers. Now, so here's the question. When you would come home, the kid who wanted to be a baseball player, who was a wrestler and other things, did you talk about trading? I mean, did, do you think that this had an effect on your growing up, that you thought of the, the street? Well, I, I know the story uh, of 13 years of age with a bicycle, which you'll tell me in a second, but... Um, I, I don't think it had much of an effect because 
he'd leave early in the morning before I woke up and he'd get home almost when I was ready to go to bed at night. So the days were long. So, it, you know, it was kind of growing up and, and know what my dad did. I didn't really understand his, you know, everything about it. But even at my earliest age, well before then, when I was young, um, you know, it was, they didn't have take your kid to work day back then. But, you know, usually it, around- It was take, it was- it, take You just took your kid to work. And so I would commute with my dad, you know, two or three times a year during vacations to, to, to Wall Street. And nothing was more exciting than watching a bunch of guys screaming and yelling with ticker tape coming by and watching the action. The action was just, it was mesmerizing. So talk to me about the bicycle story. So my dad didn't believe you should get something for nothing and he believed you had to work hard for everything. And so when I was 12, I wanted a new bicycle. Um, and, and my dad said, you know, you need to come to work. So I think it was more my mom wanted to get rid of me for the summer. So I would, uh, I would commute to work with my dad uh, three days a week out of the five. And at the end of the summer, I got a bicycle. And my job really back then, which was interesting, was they had just, it was, it was in the early days, um, almost before it was announced, it was the merger was going to occur. And they didn't have all the equipment they have today to, to, to communicate. So one group sat two elevator banks away and they sat here. And next thing you know, we had to go back and forth and I had to run up and down elevators all day delivering trade tickets. And I thought that was the, the coolest thing in the world. So the 13, this is 1970. Actually 12. Okay, so it's 1969. At this time, you're involved with fixed income over there. And then in the mid 70s, Drexel has this guy who grew up in Southern California who went to Wharton and he says, I'm coming out with something called junk bonds? No, what, what really happened at that time is that when we, we acquired Drexel Firestone, we looked at the balance sheet and there was a, a line item which showed a, a big profit. Now at that time Drexel Firestone was in bankruptcy and we had no clue so we just disregarded it. It didn't make any difference. Then once we merged, I said, you know, who's, who's doing what? And we interviewed people who we want to keep and people who, did, you know, who we let go because it was duplication. And Mike Milken was the individual that was running the fixed income department in uh, Drexel Firestone. Now he was what at this time? Late 20s, early 30s maybe? This was in 1973, I believe. 73, something like that. So it's got to be in his mid 30s. Mid, mid, mid 30s, mid -30s mid because he's about 67 now. And I sat down and talked to him, and I said, Mike, what would you like to do? He says to me, Ed, take a walk. I said, okay, where are we going? We're going down a floor below. And in, in that office was all these file cabinets. And he opens up one as all these prospectuses of all these companies. He said, that's and some of the companies we never even heard of. They were low, gray, because at that time, most people were trading uh, B double A, A double A, and triple A. Nothing below that. But he was involved with some major underwritings uh, at that yeah, time. Well, that was later on, and then basically he wanted to do that. He did all his research, and all these researches were all in these file cabinets. He says, "I would like to trade and do new issues for any bond that's rated below B double A." I said fine with me because we didn't do anything like that and he was profitable so well, well he got profitable when we started and you know we knew nothing about it and we gave him a, a line of credit that he was able to trade and he was responsible for all the new issues that would would, would come out below BAA and uh, I said to the fixed income department at that time you no longer responsible for any issue below BAA and Mike started with two other of his people that's how it started so that was in the mid-70s. And that's the, today's junk bonds. Right, and, the, and that lasted basically to 89, 90 over right, the right. period of time. That's right. And at that, at that time, you were, you were elevated, to be, you became vice chairman of the firm. Yes, in charge of all uh, capital markets. So now you're, you're growing up in, in Plainview, and you're five foot three? Five three, 100 pounds. Five three, 100 pounds. That was my, my way to graduation. High school graduation. Now, you said you wanted to be a physician originally. Yeah, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Why? Because it was in, I think uh, it was in the DNA? It was yeah, the DNA was. that your father said? It was the East New York mother, DNA. It was, it was literally East New York. Mother, his mother that wanted to be a doctor. I think she wanted me to be a doctor. So she wanted you to be a doctor. And um, 
but you're five three over here. How do you decide to go to Syracuse? You, I mean, you know, as people said, there were safe schools. There were a couple of schools. You know, you graduate. Well, you know, life was different back then. It wasn't like it is today that every kid knows and talks about what college they're going to. You didn't actually really think about college back then until about, a, you know, that same year. You know, you didn't you didn't have tutors. You didn't take you didn't care about the SATs. It wasn't something you focused on. My whole life growing up was sports. I played multiple sports. It's what I cared about. Um, and Syracuse had a wrestling team, and Syracuse had a, a journalism school. I, I wanted to be a sportscaster. They had a great journalism school. And I was like, okay, I'll go there. Yeah, but what happened with the SATs, you said? Uh, I left, because you told I left, the story when you spoke at the Whitney Yeah, school. I left a little early because I, I, uh, I didn't finish the SATs because I had a wrestling match that day. So you get to Syracuse, and this is the very interesting, that you're 5'3", and I don't know. I know my son... I think in his fourth year of high school, picked up about six inches, so he's about 6'4 now. Maybe even picked up more. You picked up nine inches during? Nine inches. I, yeah, I realized uh, my, my dad was like, you can go wrestle, but you're going to go do it as fun if you want. And you, you realize when you go to a top 10 school in the nation that they're far better than you are and that they, they practice five hours a day. And so it didn't take very long for me to understand that this was probably not going to be a career uh, but but you like baseball also. I like baseball, yeah. but I was still I was still too small. You know, you, you realize you're really good in your town, and then you get to play against kids that are a lot bigger than you, and you realize that maybe you should think of something else. Now, when you're going to Syracuse, you're working the summers with Dad at Drexel. I'm working at Drexel every summer. Yep. And what in what areas? Uh, I did uh, Muni's one summer. I did Syndicate one summer. I did uh, uh, retail corporate bonds one summer. Uh, so I, I, I kept hitting so, so when do you decide, or when does your father say to you, hey, kid, you, you're not going to be a physician. You don't like sports anymore. You like sports, but Love you didn't it. like covering these people, you said, nope. because you didn't like the, the athletes. The, player, the players were not as much fun. To, to, I mean, I was covering them in high school. I was actually covering what I call the second-tier sports in high school. Um, and you realize it's not as much fun as it looks. So how do you decide? I realize it was in the DNA, as I said before. If you weren't going to be a, uh, a physician, you're going to be a lawyer. Well, it was, it was, it was actually a little more. I, I actually went from Newhouse, which was probably one of the best journalism, journalism school. schools in the nation, and I decided to go into the, into the business school. So you went to the Whitman School. So I went to the Whitman School. It wasn't called the Whitman School back then. That came later. I went to, and I became a finance major and an accounting minor. And... Uh, I was like, okay, I'm graduating. Let's see, business school's two years, law school's three years. Three years seems better than two. Law school it is. And F. Lee Bailey was always somebody that I was really impressed by, so I was like, I'll give law school F. Lee a Bailey was a criminal attorney. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, that's not corporate finance. I, I, you know, the funny part, if I, if I did it again, I would probably be a criminal attorney. I think the only thing I'd actually be, what, what, the problem was I was really interested in being a criminal attorney, but I became a corporate attorney. So you're in law school, and then one summer you work for what? This firm, Marshall Bratton? Marshall Bratton, Green, Allison, and Tucker. And what do you do there? I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I get an offer to go back at the end of the summer. It's my, going into my last year. Now, I, now, Ed, did you want him to come back to the street at this time? Did not, you? not really. No. No. So you come So back. I get an offer. And first semester, I had just gotten married. And uh, um, I get a call saying the firm is splitting up. I end up getting three different offers, and I end up going to a firm called Safe Arthur Schaffelwether and Geraldson in the corporate group that they started in New York. But from there, how do you, I mean, I, I realize that Pop gave you the, the, the education of the bonds. So interesting story is that, that the head of corporate finance when my dad was running trading was a guy named Fred Joseph. And uh, um, the, one of the corporate uh, clients of, of Marshall Bratter and Safe Arth was Drexel. And I worked on a lot of real estate deals, one of them being Southmark American, which is an old company going way back. And the partner there was a guy named Richard Frary. And I did a lot of work with Richard there. So one day I'm on my phone with my dad in his office, and my dad is always one of these guys that is on the speakerphone. And he ran the newly started commercial mortgage business and residential mortgage business. Those securities didn't really exist before, before that time. And he had three guys, one of them being Fred Joseph's brother, Steve, in his office. And, and Steve goes, how, how do you like being a lawyer? And I go, I kind of hate it. And he said, well, why don't you come work for us? I said, I don't want to work for Drexel. He said, well, just come talk to me. So I went in to talk to Steve and his three partners in the next day. And they called 
Richard Freire to check on me. And Richard called Fred Joseph, who called me without telling my dad, and said, you need to hire this kid. Don't let your brother hire him. And so, you know, I get a call from Fred Joseph. And, and probably one of, the, one of the coolest days ever, you're sitting in, in, in his office, which sat in a bullpen, and Boone Pickens is calling, and Steve Wynn is calling, and he's just leaving you there to, to let you listen. And you're like, oh, my God, this is like the greatest. You're in America. awe. You're in awe. In awe. And he goes, I'm pretty good. He goes, I know I can convince you to work here in about an hour, maybe 10 minutes. And he says, and I hear you're pretty good. You can convince me the same thing. So why don't you come work here and work for me? Now, before we continue on your life, I want to get to the story about when, when you were at Drexel about this guy by the name of Mike who comes and he has an idea with some terminals. Bloomberg? Yeah. Uh, Michael Bloomberg <clears throat> had Bloomberg. Bloomberg. He had left one Solomon. Of my, he left Solomon, and one of my good friends, our good friends, Mike Epstein, he worked for Solomon, and Mike said he wanted. He's looking for people to invest in in that Bloomberg. Yeah, this terminal, right? <laughs> yeah. So he said to come to see me. So I was, I believe, I was the first one that he came to see. I'm not sure. And I had a little office outside my regular office, a little conference room. And Michael comes in, sits down, tells me all about his idea of creating Bloomberg terminals and everything else. And I didn't have the foggiest idea about computers at that time. So I call up my, uh, yeah, think, well, my back office. By the way, that hasn't changed much. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked them, I says, what do you think about this idea? So they said to me, we could do the same thing. It's no big deal. So I told Michael, I said, Mike, I'm sorry. I can't do it. And Mike said, you're welcome, and left. And right after that, he went to Merrill Lynch and got his funding. Hey, one of the large, one, still to this day, kick See, myself. But your son, later on, because he works for a lot of companies, and then you, the two of you get S2K, which we'll talk about in a little while. So what happens next? So now you're working for Fred Joseph. So, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's the 80s, and, and, and junk bonds is just really kind of, you know, it's being used for the first time as an M&A tool to take over companies, and it's kind of fun. You know, we work in 20 hours a day, and no one's complaining, and we think it's the greatest thing in the world, and you're, you're doing the greatest deals ever. And then one day you wake up, and they go, we're going bankrupt. It's a Monday. It's a Monday morning, and you're, you're all losing your job by Friday. So there are two paths. Half the guys I work with said, I'm going to go take a vacation. We just work so hard. Um, and I was married with kids at that point, and I was like, no, I'm going to get a job. And I, I was lucky enough to, uh, to get an interview by a guy named Bob Pangia at uh, Payne Weber, and he put me in charge of, quote, their real estate group, which didn't really exist. And then you were involved with that Payne Weber with a lot the of- I the business over there. Right, you did a number of the REITs, and then you went to DLJ. I went to DLJ, and from DLJ, when it merged with Credit Suisse, went to Credit Suisse. You, you, you were in on your own, but at Credit Suisse, you were the king of the CMBS market. We did I, pretty good. I mean, you, you good. know, there were very few collateralized mortgage issuance without the Steve Cantor name or the team behind it. it was, well, here's what we changed, and I, and I learned this from my days at Drexel, which was, you know, we, were, we didn't have the, it actually, we, it started at DLJ, we didn't have the biggest balance sheet in the world. And, we, and if you kind of looked at the deals back then, the key was, could you sell the, 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 the what I call the risk part of the, of the deal? And everybody didn't really have people that did that for them. I went out and hired a team to basically distribute the risk part of the trade. Because I would run out of balance sheet eventually, no matter how big I was. So we were the first guys that, that really made a formal program to sell as, the risk. As we would say, laying off the risk over there. We laid right. it off, and we knew what we, the rest was all investment grade. You know, we had no problem in with In essence, what you were doing was following something that the insurance business had done since the 14th century. Absolutely. Laying off the risk to different levels, of the reward. Distribution so. is key on Wall Street. Exactly. Unlike, because there's big balance sheets. If you can't distribute, you will run out of a balance sheet. So you stay at Credit Suisse for what, about 10 years? Between DLJ and Credit Suisse, 10 years. And then you get involved with the creation of uh, the mortgage business at Cantor Fitzgerald. Yes. You're running investment banking. And then, as you said to me before, you and dad sit down because your father said to you, maybe one day you should be your own entrepreneur, your own boss. Yeah. Um, you think about it a lot. Uh, I, you know, the, the part is life kind of takes over. 
And when you think about it, you don't really kind of find the time. And so, so how do you create S2K? Uh, six of us start a company called S2K Partners. Uh, we're, we're, I'm a real macro player. I don't believe I'm that smart. So I always believe if I get the macro trend right, uh, we win. So when we created the CMBS business over at Canner, the, the analysis was that the street had to get out of CMBS because of Basel III and that we could take advantage of it. Brand, I met a guy named Simon Fuller, and Simon and I shared the same vision, which was brand content and talent. Now, Simon's from American, American Idol. American Idol uh, and, and the Spice Girls. And we shared the same idea that brand content and talent were undervalued assets and distribution would become less important in that world, that the content would become more important. How do you get involved with Avion? Uh, a good friend of mine named Kenny Austin started it. He uh, was one of the, one of the, the people that started uh, a Marquee Jet. And he had an idea that if you could create the number two tequila in the world, you, would, you, would, you had something special. And you know, another business lesson I've learned is always get involved with really smart people. And Kenny being an extremely great entrepreneur and a great marketer, he created Avion Tequila. And I was one of the first So let's guys. talk today on um, what, one of the new areas that S2K is getting involved with is uh, as an SBIC. Correct. Um, you know, once again, on a macro trend, the banks have gotten away from backing. And we learned this because we, we now back small and medium-sized companies on the equity side. And we've learned that the banks have, have gotten rid of, forgotten them. Wall Street does not bank small and medium-sized company. Commercial banks do not bank small and medium-sized company. It's a problem. And, and that's what made America. At the end of the day, what made America was the ability for small and medium-sized companies to start and to, and to grow. Because there's so much talent in this country, so much talent. So we found a program that says if we can raise up to $75 million of equity, if you can get approved, which we did, then the government will give you leverage to go and make loans to small and medium-sized company. We want to build that business. So we want to help build America. So that's one of the businesses, and your dad's over there doing that. Let's talk about uh, your kids. I have two girls. My eldest is Erica. She's in the process right now of becoming a web designer. She worked at Apple. At one point, I wanted to be a filmmaker. The other is just graduated USC a year ago and just finished her first year at law school at Cardozo. And uh, against my wishes, um, she wants to be a lawyer, and she, but she wants to be a criminal lawyer. You have two brothers. I have a brother and a brother sister. sister, and what do they do? Well, my, uh, my other son works for my uh, trading, a minority firm. He went into trading. Against uh, the advice of his father, right? <laughs> no, no, no. he no. might have had the advice of his okay, father. Okay, right. And uh, my uh, other daughter is housewife. It's been a, an interesting ride, and I, I know that the Canthers will be successful with the SBIC and anything else you do with S2K. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.